come on a journey to lost civilizations. See ancient artifacts and long lost ancient scrolls. The strange writing on this clay brick is known as cuneiform. Hear international presenter Gordon Gossett and travel with him to ancient Babylon and the island of Patmos to discover how ancient mysteries reveal the future. I want to welcome you in the audience and those that are watching on screen to our series called Ancient Mysteries Reveal the Future. This is a series of audiovisual presentations where we look at ancient texts, we look at archaeology, we look at university history, and we see that some very ancient mysteries can reveal a very real future for us here today. In fact, these mysteries will reveal your future. We're going to be looking at a two-part series, Journey to Eternity, Egypt and the Phoenicians. Part one is about Egypt and it's called Life After Life. This is a very important topic. It's going to affect every single one of us. What happens when we die? Because it's such an important topic with such an eternal consequence for each one of us, I just would ask that you bow your heads with me as we pray. Father, as we open your word, we look at history, we study logic, reason and rationality. Father, I just pray you'd open our minds to understand the truth on this topic and who we should believe, for we ask it in Christ Jesus' name. Amen. You remember at our last presentation, we talked about the two lies. Uh, the, we talked about the two contrasting statements. One from the black corner, one from the red corner. One said, you shall surely die. The other said, you shall not surely die. Tonight, we're going to have a look at how much the lie from the black corner, you shall not surely die, has affected our world and all the civilizations. The ancient Egyptians, they were obsessed with eternity. In fact, they had to have some ingredients for eternity. When you died, you had to have some ingredients for the life after this life. First of all, you needed to have a body for the soul's return. That's why they became so proficient at this extreme embalming of bodies that they would last, what they thought, forever. You had to have a tomb to protect the body. That's what the pyramids in Egypt are all about. These were tombs for the very rich and affluent. And these pyramids are massive. They, you see them in pictures, you see them on screen, but when you see them in the flesh, they take your breath away. For example, Khufu's pyramid, Cheops pyramid, it's also known as, the largest of the pyramids, if you cut all of those massive blocks in that pyramid into 30 centimetre by 30 centimetre squares, and line those cubes up end for end, they would go around the coast of Australia twice. What is even more staggering is we know how long it took to build this pyramid, putting these huge rocks in place. Some of them are massive stones. You see the size of the stones compared to the people in the picture. To build the pyramid in the time, they had to place one stone in place, cut and in place, every two minutes. How did they do that? The Pyramids used to be capped in white alabaster stone, so they would glisten. They would be glistening in the desert. You see some of the covering on the top of the pyramid here with the sphinx behind it. This was to show the glory of the resting place of the great, uh, the great pharaoh, the resting place of the great king. That pyramid is so big. If you took the Muhammad Ali Mosque in Cairo and the Notre Dame Cathedral in France, they would both fit inside that pyramid. You could also take St. Peter's in Rome and St. Paul's in London and fit them inside of that pyramid. That's how big the building is. And in fact, you would still have room to fit the Colosseum and you'd have room left to walk around in. Staggering the size of this Monument. And what was it built for? Simply as a place for somebody to spend eternity. You also needed to have a heart. The third thing you needed was a heart for the judgment. And we notice here in this segment of the Book of the Dead, it's the, this is the judgment scene. The 
a person who's passed from this mortal coil would be led in and their heart would be taken and would be put on the set of scales. And on the other side of the scales, we notice this feather called mart. And your, your heart, based on your deeds, had to be lighter than the feather. I don't know about you, friends, but I'd be looking for the biggest ostrich I could find, and I'd be making that feather as wet as I could with mud before I put it on the scales to weigh against my good deeds, because I know that my good deeds would be way, uh, my evil deeds would be way heavier, heavier than a heart. But you see, friends, if the, the scale went down on your side, then you got eaten by this crocodile god. Probably not a happy ending. What else did they need? Well, they needed a name for the identity of the person through eternity. You notice these things here, they're called cartouches. A cartouche is hieroglyphic language that just is simply your name. It's like your signature. So that's the, so that your spirit that wanders round through the realms of wherever after you die, when it wants to come back at night, it knows which body to go into because you can't have the wrong spirit in the wrong body. I mean, perish the thought. So that's, what the, that's the reason they had katushas. The th fifth thing they needed was things to enjoy in the afterlife. You've heard of the saying, he who dies with the most toys wins. That's a modern slogan. But the Egyptians were the first that ever came up with that that ideology it explains the treasures of the Pharaoh Tutankhamun. We found his tomb. The trouble with the pyramids was that they were big signs. They were signposts that said, Hi, I'm full of treasure. Come and get me if you can. And that's exactly what the grave robbers did. They broke into every one of these pyramids. Every one of them is depleted of their treasures. So what they started to do when they realized the grave robbers were as the the funeral procession was leaving the pyramid out this door, the um, grave robbers are ready to go straight back in and rob the place. So they started to bury people in caves. It was easier to hide them in the Valley of the Kings, you know, not far from Luxor. This is the, during the time, the 18th dynasty is during the time of Moses. Cecil B. DeMille directed that amazing movie, The Ten Commandments, set at this time. And there was a children's movie done about Moses called The Prince of Egypt. This is the time that Moses was alive, that they were burying these kings. And one of these tombs they found was the tomb of a young boy king called Tut and Carmen, 1,325 years before Christ, over a 1,000 years before Christ. And in his, in his tomb, there was amazing treasures found. The discovery of his true tomb was quite interesting. We had Howard Carter, after the First World War, was an archaeologist who was convinced that there was another tomb they hadn't found in the Valley of the Kings. And so he was funded by a man called Lord Carnarvon, and he was digging and digging and digging until Lord Carnarvon said, I can no longer fund you, and he said, give me one more year. And in 1922, he found one of his um, servants, workers, found a step going down and so they started to exca excavate and with more and more excitement they started to find a stairway going down to the door of a tomb and when they got there they found the seal on the tomb had never been opened he wired Lord Carnarvon Lord Carnarvon drove down from England and on that fateful day as Howard Carter with a chisel given to him for his 17th birthday by his mother he nailed a hole through the door he he was up standing on a, on a pedestal trying to peer and he put a candle in the, through the hole and Lord Carnarvon with his daughter beside him said, what do you see? Howard Carter gave, made those famous words. He said, I see wonderful things, gold, gold everywhere. And today we can see what, if you go to the Cairo Museum, you see what Howard Carter saw. Gold, gold everywhere. Everything made of gold, gold soldiers, gold chariots, his golden throne even. And in there they found a canopic chest for the internal organs. What, was it, what were they for? For the internal organs. So they took the heart, the liver, the lungs, the kidneys, and they put them inside these chests. They found this wooden chest, and inside it was a, an alabaster chest, and inside that was a smaller alabaster chest, and inside that was some four little alabaster statuettes 
facing each other. A bit like those Russian dolls. You just keep opening one and there's a smaller one. And inside them, there was four little gold sarcophagi. And inside of them were Tutankhamun's organs. Why? Well, you're going to need your organs in the afterlife, of course. One of the greatest discoveries, though, was this huge box. The box the size of a small garage, car, automobile garage. And they opened the box, and inside they found another box. And then they opened that box, and inside that box they found another box, and then yet another box. And then when they opened it, they found a huge alabaster, a box, I suppose you could say, but a, a container. And inside that was another, and yet another, and then they finally found a wooden sarcophagi covered with gold. And when they opened that, they found a solid gold sarcophagus, what we would call a coffin today. And when they opened that, it was the first time in 3,000 years that anybody had seen Tutankhamun. And here he was, Tutankhamun, the young boy king, buried rapidly, not a very wealthy king. He was just a, a young king. There's many reasons why he was suddenly given the throne and then he died early. And they had to put him in his tomb very rapidly. And the treasures of Pharaoh Tutankhamun awed the world. What would it have been like if we'd have found Khufu's? One of the great, the great um, pharaohs. What about Ramses? Tutmosis II. Imagine if we'd have found all of their treasures, how overwhelming they would be. But the reason they took them, friends was because in the afterlife you needed to have some toys to play with. But Ecclesiastes says that there's a deeper reason than that. God has put eternity in each one of our hearts. God has put eternity in your hearts. Everybody wants to live forever. Everybody wants to be forever young, don't they? How many people want to grow old? Nobody. How many people want to die? There's a popular song that used to be around when I was young. It says, everybody wants to go to heaven, but nobody wants to die. That's true, it is true today as it was back then. But people want to be young. We remember Ponce de Leon and his search for the eternal fountain of youth in South America. People are looking for this elixir of life because we don't want to face what happens next. But friends, the Egyptian belief was very fragile, don't you think? Extremely fragile. Most of the mummies are missing. If you go to the Cairo Museum today and you'll see all the mummies... They've got labels on them who they are. I'm not 100% sure that the DNA testing would have been so good back then because they found all of those mummies just dumped in one tomb. The grave robbers would rob the tomb. They would steal even the coffin and just throw the body in a pile. They found them all lying in a pile. Probably not the afterlife they were looking for. Treasures and things for the afterlife are all gone. Very, very unsure unstable future the Egyptian belief I believe in fact it was only relevant to the rich what happened to you if you were poor and you couldn't afford treasures you couldn't afford a tomb you couldn't afford embalming you had no hope in the afterlife hopelessness so friends the last empire is about to appear we are living in the last days of earth's history I believe so how much more important for us to understand eternity now Eternity, that place where there is no tears, no pain, no sorrow, no death. How can we be in that last empire? How can we be in eternity? How can we have life after life, if there is such a thing? Well, Revelation 14.6 talks about the everlasting gospel. The everlasting gospel. What is the everlasting gospel? The gospel is the good news. It's the way to eternity. It's the way to find life after life. Second Timothy. Timothy was a, a young protege of the Apostle Paul and he wrote some of the most poignant, relevant scriptures for us living in the end of this world's history. He said, Jesus Christ, who has abolished death, he's already abolished it and brought life and immortality to light. How, friends? Through the gospel. Life, immortality, that which is everybody seeking, that which the Egyptians were seeking is brought to light through the everlasting gospel of Jesus Christ. It's good news for all people. 
It's this everlasting gospel that was, is to be preached in the end times is to go to every nation and tribe and tongue and people. Everybody is to receive this message that, the, that Jesus has opened the door. He's flung open the, the door of the grave into everlasting life. God loves all and wants all to have eternity. We saw in the last presentation, the red corner was willing to sacrifice absolutely everything. And in the coming presentation, you're going to see exactly how much he sacrificed. You don't want to miss that. It's going to be beyond your imagination what he was willing to lay down because he wants everybody to have eternity to the point he was willing to sacrifice it for himself. Paul, uh, Peter wrote, the Lord is not willing that any should perish. But that all, it goes on to say that all should come to repentance. That's what God's will is. God wants us to have eternity. We lost it. We lost it, why? Because our first parents believed the lie from the black corner. And they ate of the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil. They lost eternity, but God wants us to have it back. Love found a way to bring it back to us. It is the gospel of Jesus Christ. 1 John, my number one favorite book of the Bible is this first epistle that John wrote. And he says, In this the love of God was manifested toward us, that God sent his only begotten son into the world, that we might what, friends? That we might live through him. How do we find life? Through him. Is it through having a pyramid? Is it through having a katush? Is it through having the canopic jars with your organs in it? How do we get life, friends? No, it's through him and him alone. Emmanuel, God with us. We saw that the creator, the, the creator, the one that created life itself, became a creature. And Emmanuel was with us. God was with us. But it was much greater than that, friends. And this is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. What is propitiation? What does that word mean? I want to take you to Petra now. I want you to take, you take you to Petra. It's an amazing place in Jordan. And when you go to this place, I've got here an interesting, it almost looks artificial, the stone. The layers in the stone are so distinct. The colors are so clear. When you go to Petra, you'll find uh, young Bedouin girls sitting with a table with a with a scarf over it and lots of these colored stones and they're selling them off for $5 US and you get quite tempted. But you think, when you see them, you think, nah, these are just man-made. They're too out of, they couldn't be so distinctly layered as they are. But on our trip there, we went, took a shortcut, went down through a wadi, which is a dry riverbed. And, I, and we found literally Hundreds of thousands of these lying everywhere. So the little Bedouin girls are on a good wicket. They just wander down, pick up some stones, sit there and sell them to the tourists. But anyway, Petra is this amazing place by the Jordan and the Rift Valley. To get in, you go through this huge, well, there's two cliffs, and you're walking between the two cliffs. It's called a seek. And as you go through, you, you see the beautiful colors in the rocks. And as you get to the end, you see this building the treasury building. It starts to reveal itself through a little crack and then it gets bigger and this rose-tinted rock building is absolutely breathtaking. You notice in the picture the size of the people compared to the door. This was the treasury building of the old Nabataeans that used to live there. There's a lot to see there. You need to spend a day there to take it all in. In fact, you need to go back several days because there's two places to go to. There's the high place and there's the monastery. Most people do one or the other because it's a big walk to get up to both. We chose in the ridiculous, ridiculously hot sun to do both. It was almost, almost killed me. But you notice the colours in the rocks, as I've showed you a, a um, sample of. Amazing rock formations and rock colours. And on the right of that picture, you'll see the monastery building, which is up to the one end of the valley. And you'll find there's lots of tombs, there's houses all carved out of this relatively soft rock. There's temples there. But then if you go to the other end of the valley, the ancient city, you climb up the stairway that never seems to end. Have you ever been on one of those stairways where, it, especially in 40 plus degree heat, you're climbing up 
carrying your water and you think, oh, it's got to be over this next ridge. You get over the next ridge only to see more hills and more stairways. Well, you climb up and up and up. It's called the high place for a reason because it's really high. And when you get there, you can see an amazing vista of all the landscape. You've got a beautiful view from up on top of this high place. But there's something quite prominent in this high place. There's this carved area of stone. And what was that for, friends? Well, we reenacted it with a uh, man from, the, from Tonga and a man from Papua New Guinea. They reenacted what used to take place there. As the sun rose, they would have a human being or a child lying on that stone and they would plunge a knife deep into the chest and rip out the heart. And they would place the still pulsating heart into this little hollow receptacle here and the blood would run down. Why did they go to all that trouble? Because it's about prop propitiation, friends. It's about appeasing God. It's about paying the price for sin. Somebody had to die. The ancient Mayans practiced the same. They did exactly the same thing in Central America. Human sacrifice. They would take people up onto these pyramids and at the top on the high place they would sacrifice human life to propitiate their gods. The Aztecs were another group that lived in Central America. I want to tell you a story about them. During the reconsecration of the Great Pyramid of Tenochtitlan in 1487, the records tell us that 84,400 people were sacrificed in four days. The logistics of that's quite staggering and maybe there's a bit of hyperbole in there. But what we know for sure is they sacrificed human beings. This um, ancient site of Tenochtitlan is now in the middle of a modern Mexican city. I want to take you to another place that was very important to the ancient Aztecs. Aztecs. It was a place called Teotihuacan. Teotihuacan was it's called today Los Pyramidos, the, the place of pyramids. These pyramids, well, there's more we don't know about them than what we know, do know about them. We don't know who built them. But we do know that the Mayans didn't build them. Didn't build them. The Mayans didn't build them. The Aztecs didn't build them. And the Incas didn't build them. The Aztecs believed that the gods built them. And these pyramids, some of them rival the pyramids of Egypt. But it, back, in, back in the time of the Aztecs, one of their kings, the last emperor, the last ruler of the Aztecs was Montezuma II. Montezuma II worshipped a god called Quetzalcoatl. And what we know that every day he would come from the capital of Tenochtitlan, he would travel 30 miles, every 20 days he would travel the 30 miles to Teotihuacan, and on top of the Sun Pyramid, he would sacrifice a human being. The reason being, he wanted to call Quetzalcoatl, who had had a bit of a squabble with his brother and sister God, and they'd cast him off out into the ocean. He got, he got exiled from the land. Well, um, Montezuma was trying to call him back by offering these sacrifices to propitiate the gods. And they had a, they had a prophecy, friends. That in the year 1519, according, we call it 1519, but according to their records, they knew the, year, the date of the year, they gave it a different name, but as what we call 1519, they had this prophecy that Quetzalcoatl was coming back. Quetzalcoatl was depicted as having a black bear, a black beard, as having a black beard and a shiny appearance. Well, guess what happened in 1519? Off the coast of the Yucatan Peninsula, a Spanish galleon arrived. They'd never seen. They'd never seen Spanish galleons. And when the men came off it, they were riding horses. They'd never seen horses. These were godlike be beings and godlike beasts. And their leader was a man by the name of Hernan Cortez. Hernan Cortez had a black beard and he wore shiny armor. I want to ask you if you were an Aztec. And you'd been sacrificing somebody every 20 days, calling back Quetzalcoatl, and he was coming back with a black beard and shiny armor in 1519. Would you have believed this was him? And that's exactly what happened for the, for the natives. Today you can see this plaque that records the meeting of Montezuma 
and Hernan Cortez on the 8th of November, 1519. So God had come back. I want to share with you, friends, the terrible result of that. Because Hernan Cortez and his men came to South America for one reason and one reason only. What was that reason? It was gold. Yeah, it's gold. They came for gold. Song says, um, nothing, there was a song written a few years ago, it says, nothing changes on New Year's Day. We're, so we're told this is the golden age and gold is the reason for the wars we wage. How true that's been through history. And these, these Mexicans were vacuuming up gold. Wherever they could find it, they were just taking it and loading their ships and sending it back. Montezuma said to Hernan Cortes one day when they were able to communicate, he said, why is it you Spanish have such an obsession with gold? He said, well, we Spanish have a disease that only gold can cure. Montezuma was wise enough to know that gods don't get sick and he suddenly realized this man wasn't a god. So he started to re reverse a wee bit in his support of this of um, Hernan Cortez. Hernan Cortez became aware of this. And while on the top of the sun pyramid, while surrounded by the people, there's two different viewpoints of what happened. If you read the Spanish viewpoint, they say that uh, one, of the, one of the Aztecs threw a piece of masonry and hit, hit uh, Montezuma in the head because they were opposed to him having such a close alliance with these Spanish. The other view is that Hernan, Hernan Cortez took a knife and slit the throat of Montezuma. But what we do know for a fact is that all of the Aztecs were genocided because of that. Completely genocided. So what they hoped was going to deliver them to eternity, in many ways sent them to eternity. I want to share with your friends that that, that deception is going to be paralleled at the end of time, where every religious belief system on the planet, everybody who watches the television is going to believe that the great God has come, and, it's going to have, and the deception is going to have far greater consequence than the, the deception that happened for the Aztecs. Well, let's go back to South America now, and we have the Incas who built uh, Machu Picchu here. Famous, famous tourist site. But once again, a high place where they sacrificed human life for pagan propitiation. Blood had to be shed. The blood of a human had to be shed to appease an angry God and to remove sin and to reconcile two parties. The difference, my friends, with biblical propitiation... The biblical propitiation isn't an attempt to appease an angry God because, number one, God brought the sacrifice. And even more amazing, he was the sacrifice. God himself was the sacrifice. And he reconciled us. He brought two parties together. He was the only valid human sacrifice. Let's go back to the book of Revelation again. You are worthy. As... as the heavenly beings are looking at the scroll that can't be opened and nobody's worthy to open the scroll. We read, you are worthy to take the scroll and open its seals. For you were slain and have redeemed us to God by your blood. Out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation. Whose blood was that? Who's the one that's worthy, friend? That's the Lamb of God. It's Jesus Christ himself. He was worthy. And what does that tell us, friends? It tells us that we've been redeemed. What does redeemed mean? When people go to a, when they go into financial difficulty, they go to a pawn shop. P-A-W-N shop, a pawn shop. And at that shop, they will hand over something valuable and they receive some money for it. The way they get it back is they go and redeem it. They buy it back. Something is redeemed when it's purchased back. And if you didn't want the thing, you take it to the pawn shop and you walk away and forget it. You've got the money, you're gone. Well, when we're redeemed, it tells us we're wanted, we're valued. And what was the cost, friends? It's the cost of the death of God in human flesh. God values us more than his own life. So sin leads to death. Righteousness leads to eternity. Where did sin come from? Sin came from the black corner. 
Where does righteousness come from? We saw that in the previous presentation. It came from the red corner. One leads to life, one leads to death. Paul said, as sin reigned in death, even so might grace reign through righteousness to eternal life. How, friends? Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Him and him only. Calvary was the, was the great exchange. His life for our life. For he made him to be for he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. See the transaction that takes place there, friends? Something needs to be purchased and the price needs to be paid. We need to be purchased. We need to be bought back from the devil's kingdom. We needed to be bought back from the kingdom of darkness, from the black corner. And the red corner just gave everything. And it's no surprise that the blood that was shed is red, and that's why I call it the red corner. Because the corner over here is, is covered in blood. It's covered in blood, but the blood was shed by the one that sat in this corner, it's Christ. This corner is bathed in blood as well. The blood of every victim of sin that's ever existed. What a contrast. Our sin was taken by him that caused his death. His righteousness is counted to us, which gives us life. Hallelujah, friends. That's, the, that's what the gospel's all about. So the question says, so what do we have to do? What do we have to do then? Do we have to build a pyramid? Do we have to get our, some canopic jars to put our organs in? What do we have to do? Do we have to sacrifice a child? Do we have to sacrifice an animal? What have we got to do? Everybody wants to do something. Well, friends, the amazing news is the gospel of God's grace, it costs how much? What does it say? It says it's free. It's totally 100% free. I want to take you to Ephesus now. This is where Paul was, was speaking, and he stirred up quite a riot because the people there that were were selling little gods. The people were into idolatry. The silversmiths got a bit upset because their trade spiraled out of control. When Paul says, no, no, you don't, you don't have to do anything. You don't have to buy a god and pray to it and offer sacrifice and take money to the temple. No, no, no. All you have to do is accept Jesus Christ's righteousness and his love and his blood for you. And it's free. Well, the silversmiths got very upset and they brought Paul, uh, Paul's companions to this very place and they screamed all day, great as Diana of the Ephesians, great as our goddess. Paul got out of that place alive, surprisingly enough. And he would later write back to them. He would write to those people, those people who had that huge commotion over the fact that you should be buying a god to get salvation. And he wrote, and you notice why he wrote so strongly to them. He says, for by grace you have been saved through faith. And that not of yourselves, it is what, friends? It's the gift of God. It's a free gift. So how much does a gift cost? That's a good question. How much does a gift cost? A gift is free. If somebody gives you a gift... There's two things that you know automatically when somebody gives you a gift. First is that it's free. Otherwise, it's not a gift. If somebody comes to you and says, here, look, I've got a really nice car that would suit you. They pick out a car and say, oh, I see this car would suit you perfectly. And you go, wow, thank you. Uh, that'd be $23,000, thanks. Is that a gift? The fact that the car suits you? No, it's not a gift, is it? We know that it's a gift. When we get a gift, we know one thing about it, that we don't have to pay for it. It's totally free. But do you know the other thing we all know about a gift? I don't often think about. When somebody gives you a gift, you know they've paid for it. A gift, somebody else has paid for it, but you're not paying for it. And so it is with the gift of salvation. You can't buy it or earn it, and somebody else paid for it. Because a man's not justified that's made right with God by the works of the law. That's human obedience to God's laws. For by the works of the law, no flesh shall be justified. How much flesh? No flesh shall be justified. 
Montezuma got it wrong, the Egyptians got it wrong, the Incas got it wrong, the Mayans got it wrong, everybody had it wrong. They thought they had to do enough to get eternal life, but no, no, it doesn't matter how much you do, you cannot get eternal life. The spotted leopard, you may have heard of the truth of the spotted leopard, uh, leopard. Jeremiah says, can the Ethiopian change his skin or the leopard his spots? Neither can you do good who are accustomed to doing evil. What a condemnation, friends. If we're accustomed to doing evil, we cannot do good. It's impossible any more than the Ethiopian can, uh, the leopard can change the colour of its skin. Can't suddenly become a tiger. There is how many righteous? How many? There's none righteous. No, not one. For all have sinned. Have sinned? Is that past, present or future? Friends, that's past tense. We've all sinned. And all fall short, present tense, of the glory of God. You can't change yourself. You can't save yourself eternally. You can't do it, friends. You can't do something to get yourself right with God. The mess that our first parents got into when they believed this usurper, this deceiver, this perfidious wretch in the black corner, when they believed him, friends, it put us in a hole that we can't dig ourselves out of. Enter God. Enter God. He paid the price. But do we have a part to play? Well, we do have a part. What we've got to do, friends, is simply believe. It's not doing something, it's believing something. He who believes in him should not perish, but have an everlasting life. You know, friends, every time you get on a plane... To fly, you're believing that the plane's going to make it to its destination. And we all know that lumps of metal don't fly. We all know that a, that a solid object doesn't fly, can't float in the air. It's not a feather. And I would admit, I used to be afraid of flying. Every time I got on a plane, I thought this isn't natural. And I'd been watching the news and I was convinced that every second plane that took off crashed and there was hundreds of people perished and I'm thinking man I don't want to be on one of those planes and then somebody sent me this video this online video and you notice in this video that the sun is moving around the planet and as it becomes daylight just before daybreak you notice these little yellow dots every single yellow dot on this map is a plane taking off from its departure and arriving at its final destination you notice as the sun goes round how China just becomes a solid yellow object. And then Europe becomes solid yellow. And then America. And look at the belt of planes flying across the Atlantic. And even down in Australia and New Zealand, we see a huge density of planes flying. When I saw that, I thought the chances of perishing in a plane crash is about the same as getting eaten by a shark while climbing Mount Everest. And, I really, and I've lost my fear of flying because it's not such a big trust thing. But let's talk about what faith and trust and belief really are. Um, Jack Blondin was a famous man. He became famous as a daredevil. He was the first man to walk on a tightrope across the Niagara Falls. First time he did it, he, he gained world fame. But, you know, once you've done it once... People aren't too keen on just seeing you doing it again, you know, just wandering across Niagara Falls. So he started to do some rather amazing feats. At one time he walked across, he spotted down in the middle of the Niagara Falls on his tightrope and he got out a little stove, he cooked a meal and ate it and then got up and walked the rest of the way. Another time he stopped, sat down and rolled, did a backwards roll. And then he did something amazing. He walked across wheeling a wheelbarrow wheeled a wheelbarrow on this tightrope across the Niagara Falls. And when he got to the other side, I'm not sure whether he went from the US to the Canadian side or vice versa, but when he got to the, the destination side, people are cheering and applauding and just, just acclaiming his greatness. Jack Blondin said, who believes, who believes I could wheel that wheelbarrow back? And they all said, yes, you can do anything, you can do anything. He said, who believes I can wheel that wheelbarrow back with a person sitting in it? And all the reporters and all the people there all, all said, yeah, of course you can, of course you can. And he said, okay, could I have a volunteer to get into the wheelbarrow? Silence. Why, friends? 
They believed. But that was a shallow belief. They didn't have faith. They didn't have trust. If they had faith and trust, they would have just leapt up there and said, take me for the ride. But they didn't do that, friends. Why? Because they didn't have that faith, that trust that they needed to have in Jack Blondin. And that's what we need to have. We can't just believe. We need to have faith that it is so, that the gospel cleanses us from sin. We've got to repent of sin. Jesus came to Galilee preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God and saying the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent. What did he say, friends? Repent and believe the gospel. Repent means to have a change of mind, to choose to turn away from sin and go in a new direction. So you're walking this way. In fact, let's use our illustration. You're walking along hand in hand with the black guy, with the guy from the black corner, and he's directing your path, what it is is you throw him away and you start walking with the one in the red, in the red corner. And you walk in a completely different way, different fashion altogether. Why do we need to repent? Paul wrote to the church at Corinth, do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Don't let the devil deceive you, neither fornicators nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners will inherit eternal life. That's pretty strong language, isn't it, friends? They will not inherit the kingdom of God. You know what the next verse is? And such were some of you. And I can relate to a fair bit on that list. Such was I. Past tense. We need to be walking in newness of life. We don't walk the same way we've always walked. We need to walk the new walk, hand in hand with the red corner. Stories told of a, a man who was in the jungle, set up his camp there, and he was plagued by this monkey that would come in and steal his food and rip up all his supplies looking for food. And he decided to deal with the monkey. So what he did, he took a jar, a jar very similar to this one, and he glued it to his table so it couldn't be moved. The jar had a narrow opening, and so what he did, he put peanuts in it. And then it, sure enough, while he was in his tent at night, he heard this commotion, he runs out, and here's the monkey. The monkey's got his hand in the jar, and the monkey's got the peanuts. And the monkey starts to panic because he sees the man coming with his gun. And the monkey's trying to get his hand out, but the monkey would not let go of the peanuts. He wanted those peanuts so bad that he's frantically trying to escape. He couldn't get escape. He couldn't escape because he wouldn't let go of what he was lusting after. Of course, that man feasted on monkey stew. And so many of us are like that monkey. We don't want to let go of this world's peanuts. We don't want to repent. We need to repent and we need to believe. What do we need to believe, friends? We need to believe that Christ is the key to eternity. John wrote in his epistle as he closes off, closes off his little epistle, this beautiful book, 1 John. He says, These things have I written that you may know, not believe, but that you may know that you have eternal life. You may know it to the very core of your being. You may know that you have eternal life. The chapter 5, in fact, he talks about all the things that we may know. He's given it all the evidence and through 1 John, based on Jesus Christ. He says, and then he starts to say, and we know, and we know, and we know. We know that we're of the world, the whole, of God, and the whole world lies in wickedness. We know that the Son of God has come and has given us an understanding. And he says that we may know that you have eternal life. Amen. He takes us then into a court scene. He takes us into a scene... And in a court, you know, we have the defense, the prosecution, and people testify this way or that way, and then the judge makes his assessment of the evidence. He says, if we receive the witness, the testimony of men, the witness of God is greater. For this is the witness of God. This is a witness of, of God the Father, which he has given us of his Son. What is the witness? What does he witness? He says, he who does not believe God has made him a liar. Because he has not believed the testimony that God has given of his son. The testimony. What is God saying in this courtroom? He's saying, 
that God has given us eternal life. God has given it to us. And how has how He given it to us? This life is in His Son. He who has the Son has life, and he who has not the Son of God has not life. Plain and simple. How do we have life after life? It's not by having a pyramid, friends. It's not by sacrificing another human being. It's not by having the most toys. It's not by doing works of righteousness. It's as simple as that. You have the Son, you have it. You don't have the Son, you don't have it. How do you have Christ? One of the last messages Jesus gives to the world is, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and dine with him and he with me. Revelation 3 verse 20. It's as if you're on a cliff face. There's an unpassable gulf between you and the place that you want to go. Eternal death, that's where we dwell, friends. Eternal life is where we want to go. How do we get from one to the other? It's too big a gulf to jump. There's too many sharks in the water. We can't climb down the cliff. There's a bridge that spans that, those, that gulf. And that bridge is made out of an old rugged cross where the God of the universe was willing to lay down his life for you. Friends, is there any better news than that? that is, that's, not the good, that's not good news. That's the greatest news. Okay. I want to take you to Wembley Stadium. This was the birthday of Nelson Mandela while he was still in prison. A lot of rock acts and pop acts all gathered for his um, 70th birthday. And after this big rock festival, they brought in a, a lady to close off. She was a singer, an operatic singer called Jessie Norman. And after all the hype and probably all the drug imbibing and the alcohol imbibing and the excitement of the days of the festival. It's coming to a close. The sound drops down. The lights are lowered. And Jesse Norman starts to sing a somewhat familiar song to many. For many it was a song they maybe hadn't heard from their childhood. But she started to sing the strains of amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved the wretch like me. I once was lost, but now am found, was blind, but now I see. She started to sing a Christian hymn, friends. The audience was quite stunned. What a contrast to what they've been listening to. Some began to boo. Some began to ridicule. But Jesse continued on. It was grace that taught my heart to fear and grace my fears relieved. And as she sang with this powerful voice, the haranguing seemed to die down and then eventually one voice after another picked up the strains of that, now, that once familiar song until Wembley St Stadium was echoing with the strains of amazing grace a song of God's goodness in paying the price for our sin. Where did that song come from? It was written by a man called John Newton. Who was John Newton? I can hear you asking that. John Newton was a man who ran away from God as a child, went to sea, became a sea captain, and then he became the most vile of offenders. He became a slave trader. A slave trader who, would, who is a person who would, who would stack human beings in his cargo on a ship. And when the ship met a fair storm in the middle of the Atlantic and the weight was holding the ship too low in the water, they would throw the cargo overboard. Living human beings were tossed to their demise in the stormy waters of the Atlantic. John Newton ended up himself falling on hard times and he became a slave until he was rescued. And he always put it down to his mother's prayers. She never stopped praying for him. John Newton, the slave trader, the sinner, this murderer, gave his heart to God and he became the pastor of this church in Olney where his ashes, where his body's buried today. And he wrote that song, Amazing Grace, How Sweet the Sound That Saved a Wretch Like Me. Was he a wretch? 
Was he rich? Absolutely. Was I a wretch? Absolutely. Maybe you're feeling like a wretch. You're feeling like a wretch today. The good news is God saves wretches like me and John Newton and he can save a wretch like you. On his headstone, this humble headstone outside of the church, it says, John Newton, Clark, once an infidel and libertine. Libertine means pirate. A servant of slaves in Africa was by the rich mercy of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ, preserved, restored, pardoned, and appointed to preach the faith he had long laboured to destroy. While we were yet enemies, Christ died for us. What a beautiful story of God's love. sure that tonight everybody has realized on the topic of of death that we've stuck to our mandate of logic reason and rationality well next time we come together we're going to be talking about the Phoenicians and we have an intriguing title it's called sin sex and Sinai